American writer, O. Henry, wrote 273 short stories and the novel, Cabbages and Kings, during his lifetime, but another captivating novel could be written about his own life. Not many people know his real name. Someone once wrote him a letter asking, Please answer, are you a man or a woman? But the letter remained unanswered. The writer himself rarely spoke about himself and was quite reluctant to do so. He avoided photographers and fellow writers. Publishers tried in vain to obtain permission to publish his portrait, but he categorically refused, stating that he had created the pseudonym of O. Henry precisely to hide behind a mask. His secret remained intact. When he passed away, his biographers pieced together bits of his life story and tried to uncover the person behind a pen name O. Henry. Our story will be dedicated to his extraordinary life. The real name of O. Henry was William Sidney Porter, or Bill. He was born in 1862 in the town of Greensboro, located in the southern state of North Carolina. His father never finished medical college but was a decent doctor. Unfortunately, Dr. Porter didn't like medicine, he dreamed of wealth, fame, and glory. He was an inventor and swore he would revolutionize technology. The townspeople considered him eccentric and did not like him. When his wife Mary died of tuberculosis, their son was only three years old. He grew up under the care of his aunt, his mother's sister. Billy didn't love his father, yet he felt sorry for him. He would always remember the hunched figure in a dirty, sweaty shirt next to a steam-powered automobile that never started. When his father passed away, they found 38 properly filed patents under his mattress, but they were of no use to anyone. The family had no money, and whenever a penny appeared, his father would spend it on alcohol. At the age of 15, Billy went to his uncle, Clark Porter, who owned the largest pharmacy in Greensboro. Every day, Billy memorized 23 prescriptions from the pharmaceutical reference book. There are 3,000 prescriptions here. His uncle would say, slapping the book with his hand. If you know half of them, you can join our society of pharmacists. That's all I can teach you. And after a year, Billy received his pharmacy diploma. Soon, Billy fell in love for the first time in his life. It was a lovely girl named Sally Coleman. He would sing songs to her while playing the guitar, give her flowers, and under such pressure, the girl surrendered. But our hero's life took a turn. He had no plans to leave his hometown, but the young man began to cough. His uncle feared his poor hereditary health from his mother, who had died young, and sent him to live on a ranch in Texas. He gave the boy some advice. The world is beautiful. It's more beautiful than any fairy tale. Always try to remember that you are a human being in this world and a true person doesn't pass through it unnoticed. Something of them remains after death. In the house they built. In the book they wrote. In the capital they accumulated. Strive to be a person who is needed by life. When parting with Sally Coleman, Billy promised to write her letters and return. However, his new life changed those plans and made him forget the girl. Living on a ranch appealed to the future writer. He learned to lasso and throw it. He would knock down bottles with a lasso and take care of horses. He learned the art of shooting from horseback at full gallop. In short, he became a cowboy. It was true freedom, and perhaps that was happiness. People of various nationalities were present there. The main language spoken was Spanish. Billy wrote to his uncle. In Spanish, in the purest Castilian dialect, I learned to speak quite well in just three months. After that, it was easy to switch to the language spoken by the great Montezuma. In another letter, he wrote. The best method to learn an unfamiliar language is to start with swear words. Then everything else is quickly absorbed. The best German pronunciation is achieved by tying the lower jaw with a handkerchief. But after two years, the young man had to part ways with that life. The owner sold the ranch, and William Porter moved to the town of Austin to stay with his godmother. Initially, he worked as a pharmacist at a pharmacy for $15 a week. Then, he became a junior accountant at a real estate firm. He also worked as a draftsman at a Texas land office, earning $20 a week, thus began a life that resembled an extended party. After a few glasses of beer, Billy and his two friends would head to a dance club, it was a novelty in the puritanical south. There, the gas lamps illuminated a wooden platform where a piano resounded. Couples danced in the thick air. For 10 cents, one could buy a dance with a girl. It was at one of these parties that Billy met an interesting girl through his friend. She was not tall, with a very slim waist. She had dark blue eyes with bright bluish whites and dark auburn hair. 
Her name was Atoll Estes. She was more intelligent and interesting than anyone he had known before. It was she who asked him when they first met. Why do people call you Henry, Mr. Porter? During their acquaintance, while joking around, Bill sometimes referred to himself by the name of the famous French pharmacist Etienne Henry. On their second date, Billy proposed to the girl. We'll be fine anywhere, right? All we need is a roof over our heads and a little money, right? We should get married. It turned out that Atoll was underage and still attending school. She was also afraid of her mother and stepfather. To this, Billy said. Tomorrow, I will go to your mother and tell her that we love each other and that I will never give up on you. But they had to wait. Finally, she finished school as the top student. Of course, the girl's mother refused Billy's proposal. With the help of a friend, Billy devised a plan. Everything happened swiftly and fantastically. They got married, and a church wedding is no joke. The parents were faced with a fait accompli. The newlyweds began living in an unfinished cottage that Bill had bought, which had no roof. They didn't even have a bed, let alone dishes. Family life began with a $5 bill. Then things gradually started to improve. They acquired a roof and a bed with the help of friends. They reconciled with the wife's parents. The family welcomed their beloved daughter, Margaret, in January 1891. Bill obtained a position as a clerk at the National Bank of Austin. It was the most prestigious institution in the capital of Texas. After six months, he was appointed as a cashier. At first, the bronze cage of the cash drawer seemed like the most boring place to Bill. It was there, while observing the customers, that he wrote his first short story in his own unique style. One day, he mentioned his desire to pursue literature. Atoll was delighted. Do you want to become a writer, Billy? He said he wasn't sure if he could make it or not. Writing is hard. It's especially hard to write simply. In his opinion, the work of a writer was not continuous inspiration, but rather hard work. To write well, one needed to work quietly, day after day. But for now, he had to forget about writing. He had to forget it for the sake of little Margaret, for Atoll, and for the modest well-being in their four-room cottage. But then an opportunity presented itself in newspaper called Rolling Stone. It could be bought from the owners for just $250, shared with two colleagues. And he bought the newspaper. They decided not to quit their jobs and started publishing the newspaper, but it didn't bring any profits. Unfortunately, the newspaper business failed, and they barely had enough money to repay the debts. He couldn't become an entrepreneur. Atoll watched her husband with sadness as he changed. He used to come home cheerful and happy, playing with their little daughter. But now, it was all over. He became gloomy and no longer shared his plans for the future with her. The smell of alcohol often clung to him, and all this happened within a span of just two months. And then disaster struck unexpectedly. In the bank where Bill Porter worked as a cashier, a shortage of $3,000 was discovered. The bank directors, who had frequently taken cash from the vault, rushed to deposit almost the entire amount. However, Porter was accused of embezzling $500. Many years passed, but no one ever found out whether he was guilty of this misappropriation. It was quite possible that at times he did take money for the publication of his newspaper, Rolling Stone, and was unable to return it. In any case, an investigation was initiated, and he was dismissed from the bank. Losing a good position in 1895 meant plummeting into an abyss. America was still struggling to recover from the crisis of 1893. Would he be unable to find work? Would he be unable to support his family? Would he never succeed? The morning came when Atoll, after checking the pockets of all of Bill's old jackets and vests, announced that there would be no lunch today. With regret, he looked at the exquisite gold watch from the Moser Company, given to him as a Christmas gift by the bank management, and left the house. He returned with the words. Now we will have money for 30 lunches. Atoll admitted that she had planned to sell her beautiful hair to the neighboring hair salon. Later, he repaid her as best he could for all her warmth and tenderness. He described this incident from their family life in a poignant and bittersweet story, The Gift of the Magi, in which he referred to Atoll as Della, the name he loved to call her. However, Atoll never had the chance to read the story. She passed away at a young age. Here is a quote from O. Henry himself. One dollar and eighty-seven cents. That was all. And sixty cents of it was in pennies. Pennies saved one and two at a time by bulldozing the grocer and the vegetable man and the butcher until one's cheeks burned with the silent imputation of parsimony that such close dealing implied. Three times Della counted it. One dollar and eighty-seven cents. And the next day would be Christmas.
As tradition goes, people leave exactly $1.87 on the rider's grave for luck and as a sign of respect for his talent. The cemetery caretaker collects these donations and passes them on to the local library. This happened later, but for now, Bill Porter was unexpectedly invited to a prestigious newspaper, the Houston Post, to oversee the humor department. The family moved to Houston, everything worked out well, he enjoyed his job, and everything seemed to fall into place. They had enough money too. However, a few months later, a court in Austin summoned Bill Porter as the accused of embezzlement. Atoll packed his essentials in a small suitcase. He promised her, I'll be back in no more than two days. I'm not guilty of this, Della. I have never spent even a cent of someone else's money. I can swear to that. He boarded a train bound for New Orleans. But he never returned to Austin. The reason was simple. He got cold feet and decided to disappear for three years, as that was the maximum term for embezzlement. Bill would be ashamed of this act for the rest of his life, as all the disgrace fell on his fragile wife's shoulders. From New Orleans, he traveled by ship to Honduras, a country that had no extradition treaty with the USA. There, he met and befriended L. Jennings, who was on the run as the leader of a gang that robbed trains, stores, and post offices. In Honduras, they managed to get by with odd jobs. This is where Bill's knowledge of the Spanish language came in handy. When L. suggested robbing a bank, Bill politely declined. These wanderings through Central America would later inspire Bill Porter to write the novel The Ransom of Red Chief after several years. He maintained contact with his family through a relative of his wife. The last letter from home, from his mother-in-law, about Atul's illness, greatly frightened him. The seizures sometimes last for half an hour. Almost always, it ends with bleeding. Bright and dreadful blood flows from her throat. And after the seizure, she lies silent for a whole day weak as a child. I know she is enduring all of this, but she never says anything. The doctor told me that she has, at most, another month. She clings to the hope of seeing her husband. And Bill decided to surrender himself to the hands of justice and go to prison, just to see his wife. And so he did. Atoll was dying. She was unconscious and didn't recognize him. She whispered something. The words struggled to part her dry lips. Take care of Margaret. That was her final plea. Whether she was happy with him, he never asked her. She always remained silent and smiled, never complaining. He was tried, found guilty, and sentenced to five years in prison. Bill Porter was incarcerated and sent to the Ohio Penitentiary in Columbus, Ohio. The conditions in this prison were dreadful. He wrote about these conditions. I never thought that human life could be so cheap, that people would be regarded as soulless and without feelings. The workday here is 13 hours long. Those who fail to meet their quotas are beaten. Only the strongest can endure the labor. For the majority, it is a certain death. If a person collapses and cannot work, they are taken to a cellar and blasted with such a powerful stream of water that they lose consciousness. Then the doctor revives them and the unfortunate individual is hung by the hands from the ceiling for about two hours. Their feet barely touch the ground. Afterward, they are forced back to work. If they fall again, they are put on a stretcher and carried to the infirmary, where they are free to either die or recover. I am capable of enduring any suffering and freedom, but I no longer wish to live this life. When the prison authorities learned that he was a pharmacist by profession, they assigned him to work in the hospital. He worked diligently and earned universal respect. Many criminals would share their life stories with him. He creatively transformed these narratives into one of his best books, The Gentle Grafter. He wrote to his mother-in-law, who was taking care of his granddaughter. I beg you, not a word, not a hint, let Margarita know where I am and who I am. Right now her father is not a prisoner, he is a journalist, a reporter for a major New York newspaper, who has gone on a long overseas assignment. He is moving from South America to Europe, then to India, and from there to China. In about four years, he will return home and bring little Marge many wonderful things and marvelous stories about distant lands. In the prison walls, Bill encountered Ella Jennings again, the former leader of the gang of robbers. Here, they became best friends for the rest of their lives. They were released from prison with a one-year difference. Ella was released later, received a presidential pardon, became a lawyer, and entered politics. Eventually, Ella Jennings moved to California and became successful in acting in cowboy movies. 
he gained fame with his book of prison memoirs, Through the Shadows with O. Henry, which captivated both critics and readers. William Porter was released from prison earlier than his sentence for good behavior. He was determined to be a respected man and did everything to forget his former name and his prison past, now he was O. Henry. No one suspected that the pseudonym O. Henry concealed the former prisoner. Even in prison, he started writing short stories and sent the earned money to his daughter. While Bill was in prison, the family moved to Pittsburgh to prevent rumors from reaching Margaret that her father was incarcerated. O. Henry went there to meet them. Finally, they were reunited with their daughter. He started escorting her to school and telling her stories along the way about being received in the palace of an Indian Maharaja or about the indigenous people of El Salvador. To which the girl would say, I wish I could see the places you've been, daddy. How lucky you are. Finally, a letter arrived from New York with an offer to work for a magazine. Henry was already 41, and until now he had only lived in small sleepy towns, so this big city captivated him. He explored every corner of the city, as L. Jennings describes it. When millions of lights were lit and the streets were filled with crowds of men and women, that's when Bill Porter found himself in his element. He owned New York, and the people became the objects of his observation. He delved into the thick of it and directed a keen microscope at them. Fame came to him at the age of 45 and grew with each story. As a writer, he usually wrote 2,000 words in the morning, 2,000 words after lunch, then took a stroll through New York, and from 11 p.m. until half past midnight, he edited manuscripts. He became the highest paid writer in America, earning $100 for a story of any length, even just 10 lines. Even Mark Twain didn't get paid that much. O. Henry had an amazing gift for endearing people to himself. He reimagined their stories and transformed them into his brilliant tales. But there was one problem. He became addicted to alcohol. Gradually, the writer couldn't do without whiskey anymore. In one of the letters from that time, he told a friend about his writing process. First and foremost, you need a kitchen table, a stool, a pencil, and a sheet of paper, along with a properly sized glass, these are the tools of the trade. Then you take out a bottle of whiskey and some oranges, the necessary provisions to sustain your writing powers. The plot development begins, which you can pass off as inspiration. Pour orange juice into the whiskey, drink to the health of magazine editors, sharpen your pencil, and get to work. By the time all the oranges are squeezed and the bottle is empty, the story is complete. One day, the writer received a small letter. Mr. Henry, if you are Billy Porter from Greensboro, please reply to me. I remember you. I could never forget you. It was Sally Coleman, the same woman he had parted ways with 25 years ago, promising to write and come back, but failing to fulfill his promises. They met again and got married. Sally got acquainted with his daughter Margaret, and they developed a good relationship. Margaret attended a prestigious school. Later, like her father, Margaret would become a writer. However, she would not live long and would die from tuberculosis at the age of 38. Despite the increased expenses after their marriage, O. Henry did not become frugal. He earned money through great effort, but spent it with extraordinary ease. In one evening, he could spend his entire monthly fee. If any beggar came to him and told tales of their misfortunes, Henry would give away everything he had, down to his trousers and jacket. And then he would see them off at the door and plead for them to come again. And they would come again. He was plagued by numerous illnesses cirrhosis of the liver, diabetes, weak lungs, When O. Henry contracted pneumonia, the doctor admitted him to the best hospital, but recovery did not come. He felt death approaching and told the doctor. It seems to me that I am embarking on the longest journey, summon my family and loved ones. And on the morning of his death, he told the nurse. Light a fire, I don't want to depart in darkness. On June 6, 1910, O. Henry died at the age of 48. His wife placed a gray granite block with the inscription William Sidney Porter on his grave returning the renowned writer to his true name. Thank you for watching the video. If you enjoyed it, please consider subscribing. Have a great day.